Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson two of my MIPS assembly programming tutorials. Now last time we had a bit of a crash course, we looked at a large number of different things. Today we're going to go back into it, we're going to take a second look at some of the things, we're going to recap them and we're going to look at some new stuff as well. Now the primary thing we're going to be looking at today is addressing modes. Now every different processor has a different variety of ways that they will access data, um, often sources and destinations of commands and things like that. Now the MIPS process is what's known as a load and store architecture and what this tends to mean is that we have to have a command that will load a value from memory into a register, a mathematical command that will do some kind of operation on those registers and then a store command that will write the value back to memory and this has to be done in separate stages in a lot of cases more complex processors, more CISC processors, they will tend to have commands that can do all of this in fewer commands or even all in one go. But because this is a load and store architecture, we don't tend to have that. And what this means is we have very few addressing modes, but I thought it was good to look at them as an independent topic anyway, because it made things nice and clear and it gave you a central point that you could come back to to check this kind of thing. We're also going to look at more complex load commands, commands that work with sign numbers and things like that. We're we're going to also discuss things like the stack. So uh, various things we're going to be discussing today. Okay, well let's go over to our example code and let's fire it up. Okay, we're going to be looking at the lesson two file today and at the start there is a jump block with a variety of different tests that we're going to go through and the first one we're going to do is addressing modes and as usual these work on the PlayStation or the N64 emulator provided on my website. If you go to my website and download the tutorials, you can have a go at this. Okay, so let's see the emulator running and let's see what we've done. Okay, so the first addressing mode we're going to discuss is known as immediate addressing. We discussed immediate last time. We're just going to recap it just for clarity. As I say, we're going to go through everything. Um, so this is where we load an immediate value. Uh, in this case, one, two, three, four in hexadecimal. Remember, OX stands for hexadecimal. So that's one, two, three, four in hexadecimal. Destination is on the left, that's A0 there, so we're loading A0 with the value 1234 in hex. And we are then showing this to the screen, and you can see at the start here, A0 equals 1234. So an immediate value is just a fixed numeric value that is loaded into a register. I did say before as well, um, some of these commands are pseudo-ops, so the li command might be made up of other commands. So um, just um, something to bear in mind there. So. That's immediate addressing. Now, register addressing is where we're using values of registers. So, for example, this move command here, A1 is the destination, A0 is the source here. They're, they're both registers, so this is the transfer of values between registers. Or, of course, operations that are working on registers, so an add command or a subtract command, things like that, would also be examples of register addressing. Now, the main one that is going to be used with regards to memory is known as register indirect with offset addressing. Now, indirect refers to the fact that we're using the address in a register as the source or destination of a command. Now, the, we have a load command and a store command on the MIPS processor. There's a variety that we'll see in a moment. But the destination of a store or the source of a load is going to be register, in this case A0. And we've got A2, which is specified as the indirect address and the address is the address within the A2 register. So whatever the A2 register contains, and in this case, we've loaded it, we've loaded the address into A2 of test data. Now, test data is a label. We can see it just here, and this has a sequence of data here. And for clarity, we've shown them to the screen just here. So you can see them just here. Now, the LA command, that's another pseudo operation, has loaded the address of test data into A2. And you can see that here. We've got the address here, and we can see that has indeed been loaded into A2 here. Now, we've specified to load the word from the address in A2, that's what the brackets mean, into the register A0. So the address in A2 will be read by the processor, and the data from the address in A2 will be loaded into A0. And you can see here, a0 equals F0, F1, F2, A3, and that is because that's been loaded in from this address here that was the address in A2. Now, the um, bytes may look reversed. Again, that is because this is a little Endian processor, and that's how little Endian processors work. They have the habit of reversing the data like that. That's how they work. Now, that's what register indirect means. We're using the address in a register. But what about offset addressing? Well, 
the MIPS processor, within, whenever we specify the source or destination address, we can actually specify a fixed numeric offset. So here we are specifying that we're going to use the address in the A2 register, but plus four. So we're going to add four to the, the address in register A2 here. Well, the register A2 contains 8001138 here, but four bytes on from that, we've got F4, F5, F6, and F7. So because we specified plus four here, we've actually loaded a one with the value F4, F5, F6, F7 here. Again, reverse because it's a little Endian processor. Now, there are a few options here. Now, actually this one here, this load of A0 from, a, from address in A2, that actually had an offset as well, but it just had an offset of zero. And the um, we can specify the offset. It doesn't just have to be positive. It can be positive or negative. So we could have specified that first one with a zero specified there. And you might find an assembler might require that. Sometimes you come across assemblers with slightly strange syntax like that. And this, this one here, as I say, the range can be positive or negative. So you can see this time we've loaded a one. It's actually come up with zero because we've loaded a value before this range here. And I guess there's no, there's no data in that area. So we've ended up loading a zero into a one here. So there we go. Now, the other thing that's worth bearing in mind is we can actually define symbols and use them in this way. So for example, we could create a symbol called my test equals four. So we've specified that there. And then what we can do is we can specify this. So instead of specifying a numeric value here, we can specify my test here. And, and the assembler will of course convert this so that when the program is compiled, this my test here will be replaced with a numeric value four. So A1 has been loaded in the same way as before. Um, this is just something that makes things more clear. And what we can do, and this is a little bit complex at this stage, but what you might want to do is, for example, you might want to point your register like A2 to the start of a block of data, for example, player settings. And then you might want to define offset four as being the player's lives, F offset eight as being the player's score, offset 12 as being the player's X position and so on. And by using text labels like this and then specifying them here using these symbols, we can make our code much clearer and make it easier for us to read later on and work out what's going on. So that's definitely something worth considering. Okay, so that's register indirect with offset, as I say, very important one there. There are a few others that are a little bit um, more obscure that you might not need to worry about quite so much. But um, one is program counter relative with offset. Now, this is basically used by some of our branch commands. Um, this is basically uh, a little bit technical. You don't need to worry about it so much. But basically, when we use a branch command, the um, de destination address like the label equals zero here when it's assembled into bytes, will not be specified as a an entire numeric address. It will be specified as a plus or minus offset from the current line of code. So this it will actually be an offset of, you know, maybe sort of plus 12 bytes or something like that to point to this label. So that's what that is doing. And then the final one that you will come across is what's known as pseudo direct addressing. Now, this would be known as absolute address addressing or direct addressing on most systems. And this would be where the entire address is specified as an entire address. So not as a relative plus or minus offset, but the total address. Um, on this processor, on the MIPS processor, we never actually specify the full address. You see the top four bits of the address is actually taken from the current running line. Um, the, the assumption basically, and the bottom two bits are actually always zero because the commands have to be 32-bit aligned. But the assumption basically here is that we're never going to want to jump to an entire new 32-bit address. And so by, um, by basically limiting this and using the top four bits from the current program counter, this reduces the length of the command because the way MIPS works, all of the commands end up compiling to a 32-bit command. Um, and so you can't specify a 32-bit address in a 32-bit command. It, it wouldn't fit. So they've basically worked around this by um, assuming the bottom two bits are always zero and assuming the top four bits are always the current program counter. But to most intents and purposes, 
a jump within the MIPS processor is specifying a full direct address. And it's not going to be relocatable. Our code has to specify the address that this program will end up running from. It, it's so that this code will work correctly. Um, branches being relative, there is some leniency there, but as I say, generally speaking, our code is going to want to run from a specific address anyway. So it's probably not gonna cause us too much of a problem. Now, th that was a little bit quick, so don't worry if you don't really understand what the purpose of all of those is. Um, this is um, something I like to do and discuss all of the addressing modes. MIPS obviously has very few, and you're gonna come across them all very frequently anyway, and you don't really, in most cases, need to w worry about how a jump command works, whether it is an absolute or a relative jump. Um, it's just going to work within your program, so it's not something you need to worry about. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to look in more detail at the various load and store types that are available to us. We did have a brief look last time at some loads and stores, but we only covered the very, very basic ones. And we're going to now look in more detail at the various options that are available. Now here we're in all cases using the A2 register as the source of a variety of loads with an offset of zero. Later on, we will be storing with various offsets just so that we can see the results nice and clearly. But in all of these cases, the, um, the addressing mode does allow for an offset to be specified if we so desired. I'm just loading from the same address in each case, an offset effectively of zero here, just so that we can clearly see the difference between these commands. So let's just fire up this example and let's see what happens. Okay, so we're going to use a variety of commands here. Now we are starting by loading the address test address into the A2 register and we're showing our test data to the screen here. Now A2 has been loaded with the address 8001138, which is the start of this range here. And then what we're going to do is we are going to load in using a variety of different commands into our different registers. And the first one we're doing is we're loading a word into A0 from A2, LW A0, comma, in brackets, A2. That's what that means. So the source is on the right in brackets, the memory address in A2, that's an indirect address there. And then the destination is on the left, A0, and we're loading a word, which means 32 bits. And you can see that here. We have loaded F0, F1, F2, and F3 from this address here. It's been reversed because it's little endian. So we've got F3, F2, F1, F0. And that's because we used LW. As I say, on this processor, a word is 32 bits. But what if we want to load less than 32 bits? Well, we have different commands to do this. We have the LH and the LHU commands to load 16 bits. Why H? Well, H stands for half. Half of 32 bits is 16 bits. But we have two commands. We have LH, which is for signed numbers, and LHU, which is for unsigned numbers. And these will work slightly differently. Now, we've loaded our signed number into A1 and our unsigned number into A0. Now, A0 here equals the value F1, F0. And this has been loaded from the first two bytes here. Again, reversed because this is a little endian. So that is the value that's been loaded. And when it's unsigned, you'll notice the top bits run zero. However, when we've loaded this as a signed number into A1 with LH here, the top bits will all be set to whatever the top bit of the 16-bit value was. Now, F1 has a top bit of one, bit, the bit 15 there is a one, that's what the, the F is made up of there. And so all of the extra bits are filled with a one here and the top two bytes become FFFF here. And the reason for this is to maintain the sign. A signed number needs the extra bytes, if it's expanded, to be the top, same bit as the top bit of the original value. So the 16-bit value here needs to be expanded out into this. Now, this is loading a half, which is a 16-bit value. We can also load a byte in unsigned, in unsigned. So LBU loads a byte unsigned into A0, and LB loads a byte signed into A1. And a signed byte will, of course, have a value of minus 128 to plus 127. I should have said a, a signed half will have a value of minus 32768 to plus 32767, just in case you don't know that. And you can see here, we've loaded our byte of F0 in here. That's our unsigned byte there. And our signed byte, again, 
all three unused bytes that weren't loaded in have been filled with the top bit of the F0, which is a one. So you can see those have all changed to Fs there, again, to maintain the sign for if we're using this for 32-bit arithmetic. If we add, decide to add that to something, we need to make sure if that value is to be treated as signed, we've used the correct commands to load it in. Now, just as a test, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change the data here, and I'm going to change this to a 7, and a 7 here, and a 7 here and a 7 here. So I've now changed these to different values here and the reason I've done this is these now all are positive numbers so they are now have a top bit of 0 now. So when we run this again you will actually see that the values that are loaded into the registers are now exactly the same whether we use the signed or unsigned commands because the top bit is now zero here. The important thing, of course, to bear in mind is that if we are treating this byte value in memory as signed, we need to use the loading byte command that loads as signed, so load byte. If it's to be treated as unsigned, we need to use load byte unsigned. There's nothing in the memory that defines the byte as a signed byte or an unsigned byte. It all comes down to the loading command that we use. So that's something to bear in mind. So that's how we can work with 16-bit or 8-bit signed or unsigned values when it comes to loading them. Well, what about when it comes to storing them? Well, we have some commands to work with 32-bit values, let's store word, and we also have a command to work with 16-bit and 8-bit values. Now, interestingly, or quite logically, of course, um, although we need two commands for signed and unsigned loads, when we store values back into memory, we only need one command because the, we will only store the amount of data we specify, either a, an 8-bit byte with SB or a 16-bit half with SH, but um, the, we don't have to do anything to maintain the sign in the same way. Uh, the extra bits will all be 1 in the 32-bit value if we're only storing 16-bit values of it and it's negative. So we don't need to store those extra ones, we just need to load it with the correct command later on. So what we're doing here is we are loading the address of user RAM into A3 here, and then we're storing the word value of A2 into the address in A3 here. And so you will see, and what we're going to do is we're going to show this to the screen later on. That's what this is doing here. And you can see that at this stage, we are showing the mem memory here. And the value 8001138 has been stored at the first memory section here and that is the value that has been in a2 here and that has been stored by this first store word command here SWA2 comma open brackets a3 close brackets now what we've done next is we've stored a second word value with an offset of 4 so we're storing a0 to the memory address in a3 plus 4 and the value in a0 is this 16 bit value here and you can see that that 16-bit value has been again reversed because it's little endian, F0, F1, F2, F3. And so that's the storing of the word there. What we've then done is we've stored a half. And remember, this can work fine with signed or unsigned values. And we've stored that with an offset of 8. Then we've stored a byte with an offset of 12. And again, that will work fine with signed or unsigned. And all of these are storing a 0. And so this A0 value will be chopped up into a 16-bit value and an 8-bit value. And you can see the 16-bit value has been stored here, F0, F1. And the 8-bit value has been stored here, F0. Now, these load and store commands all need to be correctly aligned according to the size of the value being worked with. So if we're loading or storing a 32-bit value, we need to make sure that this is aligned on a 32-bit boundary, which means that the bottom two bits should be a zero. Now, if we're working at 16 bits, then we only need to be on a 16-bit boundary, meaning the bottom bit will be zero. If we're working with bytes, this can be anywhere. There's no um, boundary requirements with loading or storing bytes. They can be at any position in memory. Now, the important thing to notice is if we do this wrong, um, we will get problems. So, for example, if I change this to an 11, well, that's going to work just fine. But if I change this to a 7, because this is storing a 16-bit half, this is now at an invalid boundary. So if I try and compile this... Well, what has actually happened? Well, we've got no results. The results have disappeared. And the reason for this is that the processor has basically failed because uh, it's crashed because we've tried to load from an impossible address here with this seven here. If I change it back to an eight, 
and I run again, well now it's worked fine and we've got our values here. And as I say, we're perfectly fine loading that byte value from an odd address here because it, it's a byte value. The half could have been at 10, 8, 6 or 4. The word could only be at offset 0, 4 or 8 here. And so th this is something that's important when working with these commands. Now generally I wouldn't really recommend it, but it's probably just easiest to you know, keep everything 32-bit aligned to be honest because memory is not going to be short on these MIPS systems. But if there is a need for you to do so, we actually have some special commands that allow us to work with unaligned data. And this allows us to bypass that limitation. So if there is an urgent need for us to load a 32-bit value or from an address that is not 32-bit aligned, we have some very special commands that allow us to do this. Now, basically, these are made up of two commands. We have a load word left and a load word right. And these load partial data from a specified address. Um, now, let's just see this in action. So what we've got here is we've got some unaligned data here. So I've put this FF at the start here so that all of these are now unaligned. So basically, these are not these values 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4 are not correctly 32 bit aligned because of this byte here. And neither is this 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4 here. And we've put an align command here to correct everything and align them to a 4 byte 32 bit boundary afterwards so that the rest of our commands work correctly otherwise they would not so what we're going to do here is um, we're going to try and load in from this unaligned data plus one so we're not 32 bit aligned with our value in a3 here now we've shown the values to the screen here you can see that the 11223344 is not aligned on a 32 bit boundary here and then what we're going to do is we're going to do the LWL into a0 with an offset of 3 and an LWR into A1 with an offset of 0, both from A3. And we're going to see what happens to A0 and A1 when we do this. Okay, so we're going to load in effectively from the 11223344 word here. Now, when we do this load, the load word left has loaded in the value of 44 here, loading in to the left hand part of this 32 bit value here. The load word right has loaded in from the three bytes here and it's got the 112233 part here. Now, if we use these, these combined in the right way, we can then actually use two commands and correctly load in the 112233344 bytes, flipped, flipped in reverse little engine, 44332211 from this part here. We can't do it in a single command, but if we use the two commands together correctly, we can do. And basically what we've got is we've got a sequence of commands, these unaligned load half, unaligned load half unsigned, unaligned load word, unaligned store half, and unaligned store word. And these are macros that use these commands to do the job for us. So they will make all of this confusion a little bit easier because basically the way these work is a little bit strange. They don't always come up with the values you would expect because uh, the data they load in will vary depending on the offset where the data is on a line too. So I would definitely suggest you use those macros. But here you can see we've used unaligned load word here and we've loaded in from A3 with an offset of zero, unaligned load half from A3 with an offset of zero and an unaligned half unsigned from an A3 with an offset of zero. Now A3 of course is offset by one in its own right. So these will all load in unaligned data. And if you see here, we've loaded A0 with 44332211 the entire 32-bit value from this section here. Then we've done the unaligned load half into A1 here, and you can see we've got 2211. And then we've done the unaligned load half unsigned here. Well, that value, uh, the top bit was zero, so that's just ret returned the same value of 2211 here into A2. So that's what that has done. Now, in those cases, we were doing loading, but we do also have commands for storing, and that's what we're going to do now. So we're going to store the value FFEEDDCC and 11223344, and we're going to test store those to user RAM plus one, and we're going to show the results to the screen.
Now, once again, we have two commands, one for the left part and one for the right part. So we're using SWL and SWR here to store the left part of A0 to A3 offset by zero and SWR to store the right part of A1 to A3 offset by four. But of course, A3 is um, shifted by one byte. So this is an unaligned address we're going to be storing to. And now let's see what's happened when we've done these stores. So the, store, the SWL storing the left part of A0 has stored the FFEE part of the value in A0 to this address here. So only the left two bytes have ended up being stored there. And it's been stored at address 20,000, even though we were supposed to be offsetting by one. Now, the value in A1, the 11223344 value, the leftmost three bytes, the 443322, have been stored to this address here and the what the one one has not been stored so these might not work as we really uh, would expect in a lot of ways now again the, the good thing is that we have some macros to do this for us so we've got unaligned store word and unaligned store half these will work with signed or and signed numbers and then what we're going to do here is we're going to store the a0 value to these two offsets here so we've effectively stored the value in A0, 69686766, and we've stored it to this address here in entirety. You can see it's reversed there. So we can use USW to store an unaligned word or USH to store an unaligned half here. And you can see here, we've stored the value 6667 to the address in A3. Uh, we specified an offset of zero, but the address itself was offset by one. And so you can see that here. So we can use those fine. There's no commands, of course, for working with bytes, for loading or storing, because those can be loaded from any address anyway. We simply don't need any. So there we go. A little bit tricky. And honestly, as I say, something I, I wouldn't suggest you need, really. I'm just mentioning them for completeness. Um, I'd suggest you just try and align all of your data to the boundary as appropriate. Really, in most cases, I'd just suggest you always work in 32-bit boundaries, even if you, the values need a 16-bit. But obviously, there may be times where you absolutely have to work in 16-bits, so these commands are here for you. A lot of processes of this kind don't have commands to work with on aligned data in that way. So I, I would kind of consider these to be a bonus rather than a necessity. OK, so that's the um, aligned data. The last thing we're going to discuss is the stack. Now, we've discussed the stack a little bit last time, but it was really a, a, a case of I had to discuss it because we were looking at other things. But now what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the stack in proper detail. Well, what is the stack? Well, the stack is a temporary store. When we are programming, there are going to be a lot of times that we're going to need to store temporary data. What I always say is I always think of the stack as being like an in-tray. There will be times where we've got too much data, our registers are all full and we need to work with more data, or we're in a subroutine and we need to now jump to another subroutine and maybe that subroutine needs to jump to another subroutine as well. And so I think of this like a to-do in-tray on your desk. And so if you're working on a job and you've not finished the job, but someone then gives you another job, you might put that first job, job A, into an in-tray and then you're working on job B. But then suppose someone comes up with a third job and the third job is even more important. You would take the B job, put it on top of the A job in your in-tray and then start working on the C job. Once you complete C, you would take the top item out of your in-tray, which would be B, work on that, complete it, and then you would take the final one out, which would be the original A. Now this is what would be referred to as a last in first out stack. Each thing goes onto the pile, each one goes on top, and when you take them off, they come off in reverse order. And that's how the stack works on the MIPS processor. So this has the purpose of storing data for us and then allowing us to get it back later. And the main purpose for this in a lot of cases will be when we run a subroutine and that subroutine runs another subroutine, we need to store the return address so that it doesn't become corrupted. Also, when our subroutines are changing the registers that need to be preserved, we need somewhere to store them. And what we will typically do is push those registers onto the stack at the start and then pop them off the stack at the end. That's what we do. Now, a lot of processes will have special commands to do this, and they will be called something like push or pop. Now, push and pop commands, a push command will push an item onto the stack, and a pop command will pop it back off. Now, the um, MIPS processor doesn't actually have these. Um, we can create macros to do this for us, but by default, they don't exist, and so we would actually have to write them 
ourselves. Now, what we do when we actually want to work with the stack is we use the stack register. And so what we would do is we would effectively change the stack register to allocate some new memory and then store the data that we want to preserve into that new memory. So here we've got an add immediate command, which is subtracting four from the stack pointer. The stack goes up in memory as things are added to it, going closer towards zero. And then we are storing the 32-bit value from A0 to the stack pointer offset by zero here. And that is effectively pushing A0 onto the stack. When we want to restore A0 later, we do the reverse. We are loading A0 from the stack, and then we're adding four to the stack pointer, putting the stack back to the position it originally, originally was. Now, we can do this whenever we need to back up and restore registers onto and off the stack, but this is going to get a little bit of a pain because um, working with one register like that creates two lines. And what if we want to work with lots of registers or in fact, all of them? So what I've done is I've created some macros for this assembler. And so what this push command will do is it will put the register that we specify onto the stack here. That's working with just a single register. This pop command is working with a single register as well. There may be times we need to work with a large block of registers. And in that case, we can be a little bit more efficient. Rather than doing these two commands for every register, we can add up all of the bytes of the registers we want to store. And we can add that value to or subtract that value from the stat pointer in one go and then store all the registers by specifying offsets to the stat pointer register. So this will push all of the S registers. And this will pop all of the S registers. And if for, if for simplicity, you want to back up and restore everything, I've created a push all and a pop all. Although, of course, if you don't really need to do that, that will be a little bit slower. But for testing purposes, that might help you out. OK, well, that's all a little bit confusing. So what are we actually going to do? Well, for, for testing purposes, we're going to load the stack pointer into T7 here. That's just um, for the debugging code so we can see what's going on. What we're then going to do is we're going to load the A0 register with A F1, F2, F3, F4, and we're going to run this routine here, which will show the stack. We're then going to back up A0. We're then going to load the value 0 into A0, and we're going to show the stack again. We're then going to call a subroutine. This subroutine is going to load a different value again into A0, and it's then going to push A0 onto the stack, show the stack again, pop A0 off the stack, show the stack again, and it's then going to return. Once it returns, we will end up back here. And we're then going to restore the original value from A0 off the stack. So we're always using A0 and we're using the stack to back up A0 at various stages, changing A0 and then checking that A0 was restored. Now, of course, we also have the return address being put on the stack here. RA is being backed up and restored here so that we can return back to RA because um, this dump stack routine actually calls a subroutine in its own right. OK, well, all of that's a little bit confusing, but hopefully it will become a little bit clearer when we actually look at what goes on on our screen here. So we've loaded A0 with F4, F3, F2, F1 here. And we can see that here at the very start. And the stack here is basically blank. There's nothing on it yet because we've not done anything that would use the stack. And then what we've done here is we've stored A0 onto the stack and we've subtracted four from the stack pointer. Now here, the stack pointer was 2004, but then it's gone down to 2000 because we've subtracted four from the stack pointer and then we stored A0 onto the stack. And you can see here, this memory here is the stack and you can see F1, F2, F3, F4, right at the top there at the top of this stack range here. Okay. So what have we done next? Well, what we've done next is we have loaded A0 with zero here, and then we've dumped the stack again. And you can see here that that's when we've been at this stage. A0 has lost its value, but the value has been backed up onto the stack. What we've then done is we have jumped to this subroutine, and the subroutine has pushed onto the stack the return address, and then loaded 1122334 into A0 and then pushed that onto the stack as well. Well, you can see A0 now equals 11223344. You can see the original value is still on the stack here. This value here, 8001036C, is the return address. Now, you can't quite see it, but you can see that is very similar to the program counter was at this stage. So that is the return address that the subroutine will return back to 
to get back to the line basically here, this load word here, after this jump here. So that is the return address on the stack that you can see there. So then after we have run this subroutine here, then we then pop A0 off the stack and we show the stack again. Now at this stage, A0 has been restored with the value 1122334. You can still see the original value here of F1, F2, F3, F4 here, and you can still see the return address here. Now, in this example, this value here has disappeared off the stack. Now, it's important to point out that it shouldn't actually technically disappear. Um, what would happen is that the stack pointer value in SP has gone back up again. You can see it's gone back up to one triple FC from one triple F8. But the value would technically still appear on the stack. The reason it doesn't is that my dump stack subroutine calls other subroutines which have put other data onto the stack. So um, it's inadvertently deleted that data, but just as a, as a point of reference, the data that's popped off the stack doesn't in its own right clear the memory. When we do a, um, a load off the stack like this, the value probably would still would stay there until something else cleared it. And it's just that dump stack routine has cleared it. Okay, anyway, at this point, we're then popping the return address off the stack here. And then what we're doing is we're jumping to that return address, effectively returning back to here. So that's what we're, that's where we are now. So you can see at this stage, what we do next is we are popping A0 off the stack using these commands here, which as I say, are effectively the same as this pop command here, just um, just not using my macro here. And then we've shown the stack one last time. You can see all the data has been lost from the stack because of that dump stack command, as I say, is putting data onto the stack. And you can see F4, F3, F2, F1 has been restored, which is the value that it was at the start. Now, the important thing to notice is, as I say, in this case, we've ended up popping the value that we started with back off the stack. But it is important when running a subroutine that is returning in this way, popping the return address off the stack, that we make sure that the stack is the same position it was at the start of the subroutine at the end, because otherwise, when we try and pop the return address off the stack, we will get a value that isn't the return address. In this case, we've only used A0 and the return address with the stack, but the stack itself doesn't know or care what registers we pushed or popped on. We could push the value A0 on and we could pop the value back off into A1. That will work fine, that's no problem. What is a problem though is if we push the value RA onto the stack and we pop it back into A0 and then we try and return and we've effectively consumed that return address, we would get a totally different value into our return address and crash our processor. So that's something to bear in mind, as I say, if you're using a subroutine, make sure you, you match your pushes and pops. And that's why I always put indenting here. Whenever I push something onto the stack, I do a tab indent. When I pop it off, I do a tab indent back. That makes it clearer for me so that I can see and make sure that my pushes and pops match. So um, that's how I tend to do things. So there we go. So that's all we're going to cover today. A little bit confusing, a few technical things. Um, hopefully you found this interesting. As I always say, go to my website and download the examples and have a go with them yourself. Now, the only thing I would say is if you found this a little bit tricky, if you don't understand it, um, don't worry too much. All of the things we've covered today, we're gonna be covering over and over again anyway in the other lessons, you know, the things like the stack. A little bit confusing at the start, but you'll see it so many times. And if you use those macros, it's not so much of a thing to be scared of. I hope you've enjoyed what you've seen today. Thanks for watching and goodbye.